This is a Nightline Friday Night Special. It may be the most exciting and the most dangerous blind date of all time. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. The first time we went to outer space, we didn't expect to find life. Now, we're out there looking for it. We can imagine many places in the solar system where life could, if not thrive, then at least survive. But if we succeed, will it be safe to bring it home? If there's a life form out there and we bring it to Earth and release it, what could happen? You know, maybe it's a disease, maybe it would, it would supplant something that's going on here. Tonight, flirting with disaster, the dilemma of looking for life in space. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. There are two American space probes currently en route to Mars, but Mars Pathfinder and the Mars Global Surveyor are on a one-way trip. They're not coming back. Whatever information they find will be sent home electronically. So even if they were to encounter some bacteriological life form, there would be absolutely no chance of accidentally infecting planet Earth. But, and here's where it gets interesting, one of these days we will be bringing soil samples back to Earth from Mars. And when we do, says a study recently released by the National Research Council, when we do bring those samples back, the risk of contaminating Earth with some foreign microbe or another is not zero. That may not be the most dynamic way of putting it. Indeed, it may just be a case of some scholars and scientists covering their PhDs. But remember that chunk of Martian meteorite found in Antarctica? That had signs of possible microscopic life in it. So, as your mother used to say when you picked up strange objects, put that down. You never know where it's been. And anyway, as Robert Krulwich now reminds us, NASA's been worrying about precisely this kind of thing for years. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Back in 1969, when human beings for the very first time lifted off the Earth to visit the moon and come home again, when we took that first round trip to the moon, we also took a risk. What were we worried about then? Well, we didn't know what was on the moon. Perigee plus zero, zero, zero. Back then, the National Academy of Sciences told the president, we're almost certain that when we get to the moon, we will find no living creature, nothing alive. But we don't know. And if by some remote chance, a tiny moon microbe just accidentally is brought home to Earth, we should warn you, there may be consequences. The eagle has landed. The whole idea of bringing back an alien species does pose a threat, even though very, very, very small threat, you still have to consider that there, something could happen. But what? Coronary? I doubt it. As it happens, just months before the moon launch, Michael Crichton's novel, The Andromeda Strain, became a bestseller, and then later a movie. It told the story of an alien virus from another planet that infected a small western town and killed almost everyone. Instantly. That's the worst case scenario of bringing back a, a non-terrestrial organism to this planet. Okay, I'm on the top step. It's a very simple matter to hop down from one step to the next. Professor Norman Pace of Berkeley says that when the astronauts hopped across the surface of the moon that summer, kicking up moon dust, no serious scientist believed there was a deadly virus lurking up there in the dust, or an Andromeda strain that would hurt humans, or attack the blood, or attack anything very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. But we couldn't know if the rocks that Neil Armstrong scooped up to take home were dangerous. He had to bring them home so we could check. And so NASA took precautions. The astronauts were told, before you go back into the LEM capsule, brush off and vacuum your suits, says Charles Berry, the mission's medical director. 
And then they took a brush as soon as they got to the, to the door of the limb, they took a brush and they brushed off the suits because there's dust on the suits too. But now I understand that when they took that vacuum thing, it didn't work very well. They had a hard time making it work well. That's true. We found there was indeed a lot of dust that got inside the, the limb, certainly. And they had some lunar, lunar dust that was under fingernails. Oh, and <laughs> Even assuming no deadly virus in the dust, there was another possibility. Once the astronauts got back to Earth, what if a tiny moon microbe slipped from their fingernails into the sea or onto the land and then began to spread? We have seen that happen. Tens of millions of rabbits. Rabbits in Australia, for example. Remember, after the first couple of rabbits landed there, within years, they were everywhere, millions of them, altering the environment. An alien microbe could do the same thing, only worse. For example, an author by the name of John Christopher wrote a wonderful little sci-fi novel years ago called No Blade of Grass, about a virus that destroyed grasses. And once our grasses die, we would die. That was a scary thought in 1969, and it still scares scientists today. This year, on March the 6th, a select team of 12 scientists released a study called Mars Sample Return, which considered the risks of sending a robot to Mars in the future, around 2003, where it would land, scuttle across the Martian surface, gather rock and soil samples, then leave Mars and return with the samples to Earth. This year, the scientists warned President Clinton, yes, the risk of a Martian microbe contaminating Earth is low, but they said, it's not zero. And then they made a startling recommendation. If on its way back to Earth, there is any rip or tear in the package containing the Martian rock samples, any chance that a microbe could slip out into our atmosphere, they advised the president, don't bring it back. The sample, they said, and any spacecraft components that may have been exposed to the sample should either be sterilized or not returned to Earth. If there's any question about the safety of a project or an activity... After you've paid the $30 trillion to send the thing there, after you've dug it up, after you've right. found it, after you've got it on its way home, then right. say bye-bye? Yes, and I'm going to forecast that the contingency you're asking about probably will show up in the environmental impact statement that the program must submit before we launch the first element. And why are environmentalists worried? Well, in part, because of what happened back in 1969. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Hornet, Hornet, over. When the astronauts dropped into the Pacific Ocean, that's them there in the capsule, their personal physician, Dr. William Carpentier, was with them on the scene. With them? No, no, I'm in the helicopter. Yes, okay. In the helicopter. And he recalls that the plan was the three astronauts were to put on special anti-contamination suits, then step out into that little raft, you see right there, bobbing alongside the capsule? And then a frogman would spray their suits with a germicide to try to kill whatever was in the moon dust. So that if anything came out on the surface of the garments, that decreased the probability that they would bring it up into the helicopter. Wait a second, wait, wait. if you wash them down, doesn't the water, doesn't the wash go into the sea? Yes, exactly. Yes. And that was accepted. Wait, but that's, the sea is where life starts. Yes, and that was accepted. And when the astronauts left, the frogmen sank the raft and the dust into the sea. That was accepted. You'd think the last place we'd want a new alien creature to go is into our warm ocean, the cradle of life on Earth. But the truth is, in 1969, nobody really believed there was life on the moon, except perhaps White House security. When President Nixon flew to the USS Hornet to greet the astronauts, they were now quarantined in a trailer. NASA's recovery chief said if any astronaut got sick or suddenly keeled over, the plan was evacuate the president immediately. But nothing happened. Not to the president and not to this little mouse. This is one of the mice that was injected with lunar material. And, uh... Fifteen creatures were also placed in quarantine. Here's the list. Oysters, shrimp, there's even a cockroach. All of them NASA injected with lunar dust to see if anything would happen. Anything that is abnormal here is a bad is, sign. Is a bad sign. But nothing happened. The mouse lived on and so did the cockroach. 
You know, we wanted something to happen to the cockroach, but it didn't. <laughs> but had there been a microbe, a killer, in that lunar dust? Then the animals, the astronauts, but also the entire Pacific Ocean might have been exposed, and that worries the environmentalists, the risk of planetary contamination. And next time, that risk will be greater, because next time, instead of a random clump of moon rocks, the purpose of the Mars missions is to hunt specifically for microbes. And when you're hunting for something, you're slightly more likely to find it. So next time, we should be more careful. But how careful? If you were the president of the United States and an aide came and said, we have just detected a tiny rip on the package of rocks and dust coming back from Mars, should we bring the package back? Wouldn't you, of course there's a risk here, but even so, wouldn't you want to take a peek? There is a risk if we say yes, but taking that peek could yield a huge reward. What that microbe could tell us about where we came from could be as dramatic as anything we have ever discovered. Part two of Robert Krolwich's report in a moment. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by the U.S. Postal Service. FedEx will come to your office to pick up your two-day package for an extra charge. UPS will come to your office to pick up your two-day package for an extra charge. The U.S. Postal Service already comes to your office every day. So we'll pick up your priority mail two to three-day package for free. So, what's your priority? Switch to priority mail from the U.S. Postal Service. Last year, Americans bought over 4 million back massagers, thousands of vibrating chairs, and so many things that look like this and this that we wonder if some people aren't sleeping on the wrong mattress. We'd recommend a Sealy Posturepedic sleep system, slept on by more people than any other mattress, including more orthopedic surgeons. Posturepedic support, only from Sealy. <laughs> Sunday, Joint Chiefs Chairman Shali Kashvili on the military, sexual harassment, and more. Plus, the partial birth abortion debate. This week, Sunday. Clean up at Maytag's best sale. Featuring our best-selling washer with the number one clothes care system at only $4.99. And here's the best part. There's more. Maytag is also offering its best-selling dishwasher at only $3.88. You'll stop rewashing all your dishes with Maytag's best-ever wash system. Maytag's best sale with low prices on our most popular models. And remember, this sale doesn't last forever. Get $30 to $50 rebates during Maytag's best sale. for a lot of different people to have the same dream. Yes, Automobile Magazine's Automobile of the Year. Toyota's RAV4, Dream of the Year, for a lot of different people. up at night into the sky, out into space, everybody wonders, could it be we're the only ones here? Well, now, some scientists believe that all you need to create the possibility of life, they say, all you really need is something wet and something warm, heat and water, anywhere in the solar system. You can find it maybe on the surface, or you might have to dig down a little bit, but those two ingredients together create the possibility of life. But where should we look? There's the little moon Europa next to Jupiter. And what else? I would say within the crust of Mars, I would say that the Jovian atmosphere, the atmosphere of Jupiter, would be a, uh, an interesting place to look. But what are we looking for? Not so long ago, most of us were hoping for, well, a sophisticated encounter with different sorts of beings, with 
different intelligences and backgrounds. They didn't speak. Or failing that, we might, oh, arrange a kind of technology transfer to perhaps improve our health. Or failing that, we might just show off a bit. But what if the only other life forms, at least in our solar system, are tiny, squiggly little microbes that may, yes, disturb our planet or carry disease, but what kind of a conversation could we have with them? Well, a pretty good conversation, says biologist Michael Meyer. With that. It would probably, you know, make it on Nightline. I think so. Because right. a close look at those microbes could suggest something fascinating. Perhaps we are not Earthlings. Not originally. We could be Venusian. What? We could be Venusian. From Venus, which means, yes, you and I were born here, but could it be that we are immigrants? That our ancient ancestors, the very first life forms in the whole solar system, did not begin life on Earth. They may have started life on Mars or Venus or here, and then they bounced to Earth. How did they bounce? Well, the same way those Martian rocks discovered in Antarctica, the ones that may have fossils in them, they bounced from Mars to Earth. Apparently, ages ago, a meteor slammed into Mars, kicked off a Martian rock which drifted for a few million years around the sun until it got close to Earth and then got pulled in. This happens every time you see a shooting star. That's a rock coming in from somewhere. We're getting hundreds of tons of material. And the question is, could some of those meteorites be carrying passengers, living microbes? Suppose there is a tiny speck of life in, say, this rock right here, when a giant meteor crashes into this space and sends this rock soaring into deep space, carrying a tiny bacteria. Is it possible that that bacteria could, in effect, hitchhike from here all the way to there and land and get out and start a whole new life? That might have happened, but there are some problems. When a meteor plunges into our atmosphere, wouldn't any life inside be burnt to a crisp? Well, temperature data just published from the Martian rock suggests that life could survive such a landing. That's correct. That's the implication. But what about time? These rocks can float around for, oh, 100 million years before reaching Earth. Could any creature live that long? Well, that brings us to the tale of the ancient bee. 25 million years ago, in a Caribbean rainforest, a little bee got stuck in some tree sap, and that sap eventually hardened into amber, trapping the bee inside. In 1991, Professor Raul Cano, a microbiologist in California, gathered a number of these insects in amber to see if he might discover bacteria in a bee's gut that had been in there for 25 million years, still alive, just waiting. That's right. And then wait for a prince to bring them back. And Dr. Cano decided he'd be Prince Charming and give them their wake-up kiss. <laughs> then again. The idea that any creature could hibernate for that long seemed absurd, and yet when he cracked through the amber to get a bit of bee tissue, this is one of his experiments in close-up. What's that thing there? The needle uh, moving slowly and shakingly towards the... You're doing this by hand. Towards... Who's holding the needle? Eh? Who's holding the needle? I'm holding the needle. Oh, you're holding the needle. Yeah, and I'm shaking because I just had coffee. <laughs> but it turned out that like Sleeping Beauty, the little bacteria in the bee did wake up after a 25 million year sleep. And these little jiggly creatures are ancient bacteria come alive. Not sleeping beauties, but still. Yeah, yeah, well, such as, such as they are. This experiment has been repeated at least a dozen times, suggesting that it is possible for microbes to hibernate for millions of years while on a long trip, land, and then wake up and continue living. If, and here's our last problem, while traveling through space, they can survive radiation streaming out from the sun. Radiation usually kills living things. But once again, these microbes are tough. 
What kind of pictures were you getting all this time? We were getting excellent television pictures. The, uh, Back in 1967, when NASA was building a robot to send to the moon, one of the workers that you see here, or perhaps not, I don't know, but one of someone, sneezed, and a germ plopped onto a lens. It was in the camera. So he must have sneezed while being constructed. The robot, Surveyor 3, was sent off to the moon carrying that germ. It landed, stayed on the moon's surface for two and a half years unprotected, then astronauts carried the camera back to Earth and discovered that little germ still there and still alive. So it survived. It survived in the camera. For two and a half years. Yeah. So, overcoming heat and time and deadly radiation, it appears possible that life can indeed bounce from place to place, which then leaves the big question. Did we Earthlings, the only life forms we know of, did we start here or did we bounce here? And the only way we're going to figure that out is to meet another life form and when we do, ask it a few simple questions. Assuming, of course, it doesn't eat us first. ABC's Robert Krulwich, who will join us in a moment. American Movie Classics brings everyone who loves great movies closer to the lovers of classic Hollywood. Find them all on AMC. American Movie Classics, the original classic movie network. Nothing takes you out of the action faster than a diarrhea medicine that can let you down. But you can count on Imodium AD to stop diarrhea often in one dose. Take Imodium AD, one dose relief you can count on. Tonight on P.I., Al Franken, Christine O'Donnell, Star Parker, and Rick Schroeder discuss sex outside of marriage and other non-controversial topics. Politically Indirect with Bill Maher, coming up on ABC Late Night. Well, Miss Mercedes-Benz. You know, it's funny, they told me we weren't getting bonuses this year. Yeah, me too. Come on, you got one, huh? How else do you explain driving a new Mercedes? The Mercedes C-Class, starting at $30,450 at your Mercedes-Benz dealers. Come on, you can tell me. Okay. They really did take care of me. Knew it. Who was it? Johnson? I talked to Johnson to say anything about bonuses. Your Washington Mercedes-Benz dealers. We're with you every mile. What are you doing in the next hour? You could be on your way to a natural-looking golden tan. Estee Lauder invents Sunless Super Tan. Its exclusive new formula lets you get a sunless, streakless tan that starts to develop in an hour. A beautiful tan. No waiting. Only from Estee Lauder Research. Now, summer essentials and a glamorous mesh tote. Yours for just $18.50 with any Estee Lauder purchase. Right now at Hex. It's summer. Time for fun. And time again for the great Chevy summer sales event. Back with great factory offers. Like your choice of a $299 a month lease or $1,000 cash back on Blazer. Make your best deal on a Blazer, then get $1,000 cash back. Or lease a four-door, four-wheel drive Blazer for just $2.99 a month. $2.99 a month. Just like this sale, the fun of driving a brand new Blazer into summer comes only once a year. So see your Chevy Geo dealers today. And Robert Krulwich joins us now from our New York studio. So when we get that first peek, Robert, at that uh, Mars microbe or whatever it is that the explorer comes back with, what are we looking for? What do we want to find? Well, the main thing we want to find is if we look at it and it resembles us, if it has our chemistry, our cellular structure, if it looks a lot like us, then we can deduce that life, at least in our solar system, is similar is probably related to us. We probably have a common ancestor. The life around us, anyway, is the same. But if we look at that microbe and discover that it's utterly different, a real alien, 
That would suggest that life can emerge, if conditions are right, anywhere, in any shape, and that life is ultimately very mysterious. That's a big difference. And before I get to the, the next question that I know you want me to ask, there, <laughs> yes. there is that question about when you talk about life being similar to us, you don't mean like you and me, do you? Or do you? No, same chemistry. I mean, it's just the same basic organization of uh, cells, DNA that allows one creature to give information to the other. And in that sense, we're all alike here. Yes, all of us are alike. All right. Yeah. Now, which would you prefer? Which, which, which makes for an easier future, if it looks like us or if it doesn't? Well, let's put it. If you and I were born on completely different planets, and I saw you for the very first time, and you looked utterly unfamiliar to me, completely alien, I might just stare at you, dumbfounded, or I might not even recognize you as a living being. But I might be relatively harmless to you because I wouldn't have anything to do with you. If, however, I looked at you and I said, gee, there's some fatty tissue there, some protein, some muscle, I think I might like to eat that or I might like to infect that. The familiarity between creatures could breed, well, danger. And so if you had to choose, I guess we might want to choose a completely alien being rather than one that looks a little like us. And the fact of the matter is we haven't a clue of, of what it's likely to be. And that's the fun, because when you actually meet one, that's when you find out. All right. Coming to a space module somewhere near you <laughs> soon, we hope. Robert Crowwich, thank you very much indeed. I'll be back in a moment. This ice cream has walnuts in it. Yes. And it's got peaches in it. Yes. Peaches and walnuts. It's never been done before. Well, what does that tell you? That I sure stayed an engineer. Retirement these days is anything you make of it, even ice cream. That's why Aetna Retirement Services gives you the tools to not only build assets, but manage them as well. Aetna, build for retirement, manage for life. Hey, Kiwi Raisin was a big hit. This morning, strange things are happening all over the world. Shops are about to open empty. Parts suppliers are partless, and assembly workers have nothing to assemble. Is this any way to run a business? With FedEx it is. Every morning the world gets just what it wants, just when it needs it, without expensive warehousing. Gone today, here again tomorrow. Now that's the way the world works. Introducing Hellman's Fat-Free Salad Dressing. Tom, I love you, but it's over. Here goes. <laughs> Tom, I love you, but... Mm, mm, mm. I know. I had to taste it in this homemade dressing. No, no, no. I didn't mm. make it. Hellman's made the dressing. Now I know how much you care. You do? I don't. You really falling hard, huh? Hellman's made it. Mm. Now Hellman's adds four new fat-free dressings, all with the fresh taste of homemade. This is love. No, this is Hellman's. New Hellman's, the freshest tasting salad dressing you never made. There's a car just waiting to be discovered. Wow. Rich in quality and reliability. Embellished with standard features like air conditioning, an AM FM stereo, and an automatic transmission. And available at a price that's a true revelation. The 97 Accord value package. Nice. See your Honda dealer today. And that's our report for tonight. Be sure to watch Sam Donaldson and Koki Roberts Sunday morning on This Week. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. If you would like a transcript or video cassette of this or any other edition of Nightline, please call 1-800-CALL-ABC. Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News, now. 
Tiger, you have a multi-ethnic background. Is there a group that you wish you were part of? Mm, I guess boys to men. Tiger's back, Saturday. Demi Moore, Michael Douglas, the film that changed the way America does business. I want to sue her for sexual harassment. The network premiere, Disclosure, 80s. Welcome back. Just announced, the great percent event is on at your local Ford dealers. Now get incredibly low 1.9% financing on Escort, Contour, Taurus, Thunderbird, and the all-new ZX2. That's 1.9% APR for 48 months, which can save you up to $4,300 in finance charges. Or choose cash back. $1,000 cash on Escort, Taurus, and Thunderbird. $2,000 cash on Taurus SHO. So hurry. With the most repeat buyers, we often say, Welcome back. When disaster strikes, communities pull together. Human nature responds to Mother Nature with a helping hand. By working closely with organizations like the American Red Cross and the Salvation Army, Anheuser-Busch responds with fresh drinking water. In the last six years alone, we've donated 18 million cans of water to victims of natural disasters. Anheuser-Busch and our wholesaler partners feel privileged to play a role in helping communities get back on their feet. Jake! My defense! Legroom. <laughs> An obedient dog. That's easy. My teammates and my Corolla. My royalties. It's down there. What can you count on? In the past 29 years, over 23 million people answered... My Corolla! The 1997 Toyota Corolla. The most trusted car in the world. The drug, cocaine. The victims, defenseless animals, sacrificed in the name of science. Who's paying for it? You are. This is not acceptable animal research. And a new Seven I Team report, Del Walters uncovers federal animal experiments gone horribly wrong. Heinous acts against animals that took place at taxpayer expense will leave you outraged. An exclusive I Team investigation, Monday on News 7 at 11. This is a new 7 update. Good morning, I'm Paul Berry. Police in Northern Virginia continue to search for a man who sexually assaulted two women in their laundry rooms on Monday. And the space shuttle Atlantis reached the space station Mir on Friday. We'll have more news later. At 11 o'clock, there's one team that delivers. There's one late local newscast that's moving up. If it's groundbreaking, late-breaking, or developing. If it's new, it's on News 7 at 11. Washington's fastest-growing late local newscast. 